worship and even demonstrates that his apostleship is real. One of the ways he does this is because when Peter starts to stumble, he then says, I had to oppose Peter and correct him. When he was waffling to the Judaizers over this very issue that we're looking at today. He then begins to lay the groundwork as to how we are justified by faith. And in chapter 3 then, next, he takes a harsher language at them and he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And we know who has, it's the Judaizers. And we know ultimately that it is Satan at work here. He then proceeds in this chapter to teach that even, in, that even the Old Testament taught that, that, that righteousness came by faith, that the righteous will live by faith. And he talked about the nature and the purpose of the law. The law does not save, it is good, but it is, does not save. It has no salvation power. And that even we are Abraham's children according to promise. And it explains and helps us understand today's message. But Paul speaks then about his fears. His tone becomes a little softer towards them. And he speaks as a parent about his fears that he has taught them all in vain. He talks about how they loved him and how he loved them. And, and they were, were a huge blessing to him. And, and now he's being treated like an enemy just simply because he's bringing the truth. But now he takes the message and he becomes a little more pointed again. But not as he's speaking sternly directly at them as much as he's speaking to those who are bringing this law in, those who are the Judaizers. And he aims his ire and he aims his sternness at them in this passage and those who have so quickly succumbed to it he is attacking this heresy of Judaism from all angles and why is he doing that well because the best way to teach is something I've found is what's called repetition with variation sometimes you have to hear the same thing over and over but in different ways. And that's called, it's, it's form of memorization, but it also is in different ways. We involve different senses sometimes as we learn different things, but Paul here, he attacks it and he goes, it's repetition with variation. And here in this passage, Paul chooses to use the method of allegory. And so that is what we come to today. Um, our passage begins in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. And I'll be reading from the NASB. Tell me, you who are under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman according through, through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children are the desolate than the one of who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir without the son of, with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. So far the reading of God's wonderful and holy word. 
Well, the title of our message today, we could simply say, Who is our mother? And we cover this passage on Mother's Day. But I want us to take a look at this strictly in the form in which Paul is speaking. And again, he is changing what he's talking to them about. And he is using the form of allegory. But the very first sentence he starts out with, he says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? In the Hebrew language, and I think it's done this way as a reminder to those people and to the Judaizers, in the Hebrew language, there is no word for obey. What is often it is used in that is the word listen or hear. And so that is, he says, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen? Do you not obey the law? Can you obey the law perfectly? No, we cannot. And what happens is when we try to obey the law perfectly, we fail, and it condemns us. Do you not understand that it enslaves? Because the more we try to obey the law, the more we see that we fail. And the more we see that we fail at that, we, th we will sometimes change our definitions of the law. And sometimes we'll make laws to help us obey those laws which is what is common, what took place in, in Judaism. A lot of times you saw these things took place where they made laws to prevent them from breaking other laws. Basically, they were bringing the walls, if you could look at the law as a building, they were bringing the walls closer in around themselves in the building and making themselves a jail cell. It was just the walls were encroaching closer and closer in on themselves. But then he says, for it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. And this is where the allegory starts, and this is where he begins to speak. And I'm not sure exactly why Paul chooses to use allegory here, but this is the method it is used to use. And one of the things is I was reading this passage and studying this, there was a struggle that I was dealing with. And doing. I don't, I'm not finding really an outline here, primarily because when we look at allegory, there's one message that's trying to get through. I couldn't find that three points that I like to find, but those four points that I like. And there's typically just one point that the author is driving at, and so that's what I chose to do. And so when we look at our notes today, you're not going to see the outline, but rather what's taking place, it's a delineation between the bondwoman and the slave woman. I mean, the bond woman and the free woman, excuse me, between the covenant of works and the covenant of promise. So those are the two things as we go down these categories. And feel free to write along in there. We're going to find some things that we're going to be finding very interesting. But what is an allegory? And I think that might be a good question that we want to start out with. An allegory, literally, and I've heard this said before, an allegory is an illustration on steroids. Um, it has one purpose, it has one point, and that's what he is driving at. And then he begins out with, he says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. And when he says the bondwoman born according to flesh, it does not mean that he was just a natural born human. He was born according to human plans, born according to human machinations and methods and thoughts and basically our own way of thinking. It's like, because when we read the story of how um, Ishmael was born, because this is who he is pointing to, it, it's Abraham and Sarah were getting impatient with God, saying, well, God promised us a son. He promised us this nation, but we're getting old. We've we got to help out God a little bit here. <laughs> and, and so that's what he's saying when he says born by the flesh. He's not saying that he was just simply a natural born son, because so was Isaac. He was naturally born. He was born in a natural way. And mind you, it was a miracle because they were much up in their years in an elderly way. But he was born in the same way. He wasn't 
born of a virgin. He there wasn't dropped out of the sky and from a helicopter or anything <laughs> like that. There's nothing. They, they were both born by a woman, and they were both born the, the, as the son of Abraham, both Ishmael and Isaac. So what he's saying here, born according to the flesh, this was their fleshly desires and they were going outside of God's plan and they were not being patient with God, not listening to God's plans. But the son of the free woman was born according to promise. Now we know that what ultimately we're talking about here is Ishmael and Isaac. But what is interesting to me, we don't see their names in this passage. We want to keep that in mind. But the promise that he's speaking of here is the promise directly that was given to Abraham, as well as the promise that is given in Genesis chapter 3 for a Messiah. Besides the one that was given directly to Abraham. And as we begin to look at this allegory, one of the things that, I, we, that helps us understand how to interpret the Bible, this passage actually helps us a lot because normally you don't see the Bible done in allegory. And so Paul is saying, this is allegory speaking. In other words, here's an exception to the rule because normally we take, when we interpret the word of God, we take the plain sense of the text as it comes to us, according to the genre that we see that whether, whether it comes from the Psalms, we read them as a psalm. We know we wouldn't read the Psalms like we would read the book of Galatians or Ephesians or Philippians. We wouldn't read the book of Revelation like we would read a gospel. These are different genres, just like we have different genres of books. And one of the ways that we can understand that is in this passage, in especially in the letters to the churches, he says, okay, now I'm going to be using an allegory. So by using an allegory and stating it up front, basically what he's saying is, is here is an exception to the rule. So in essence, he's telling us a rule. We take and we read scripture in the plain sense of the word. It's basically what he's saying. Here's an allegory, but normally we don't do this. We're taking the plain sense of the word. And so that helps us understand how we interpret God's word. Not necessarily by allegory, unless he points out there's an allegory. And so that's what he's telling us here. It says, for these two women are, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. And, and this is the interesting part where he gets into it. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. And so this is the setting up where he's talking about the covenant of works. And he says, this, the covenant of works is Hagar. She is to be the mother of slaves. And she is this Mount Sinai. This is that part of this allegory. And which corresponds to the present Jerusalem. And if we think about what was taking place in Paul's time, present Jerusalem was under Roman rule, or an attempt to be under Roman rule. And they were in bondage. They were not of their own. They were not free. So they understood this. They understood, okay, Hagar, Mount Sinai, okay, Jerusalem, it's not a free country. It's not a free city. They can get this picture of what he's talking about when he's speaking about the covenant of works. They're not doing things according of their own freedom, of their own uh, choice. They're not free. And so that's what he's speaking about here. That's the mother of the covenant of works. And as I was reading this passage, I, 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 I was looking at this and I was going, okay, we have Hagar and then we have Sarah. No. Sarah's name isn't mentioned here. But and that's what I began to, and, and the a lot of people that I read, and some people that I read, 
as I, was, as I was studying for this message, they kept mentioning Sarah in the book. The passage doesn't mention Sarah, does it? And I had to rethink this whole process because first it talks about Hagar. Well, naturally our minds would go to Sarah. But that's not the mother he talks about who is the, uh, of the mother of the covenant of promise. Who is the mother in this passage? The mo mother in this passage is in verse 26. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. There's the difference that we see here in this passage. And we have to understand this is allegory. We have to interpret this by allegory, not by our own direct thoughts that continually pop up. Well, oh, yeah, Hagar, well, her opposite would be Sarah. Yeah, that's kind of there, and we're going to be getting into that a little bit more. But ultimately, the two mothers is Hagar and the Jerusalem above. And that's what he's speaking to here. It's kind of almost confusing a little bit, and it was for me as I began to read this, but it makes sense. The other thing that I noticed there is with regards to um, Hagar, he says she is Mount Sinai. Why is she Mount Sinai? That's where the law was given. But there's no mountain on the other side of the picture. Why? Well, we can, if we look at the book of Hebrews, we, we see where it talks in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, we come to Mount Zion. That, uh, and it even speaks of that, that same language of that Jerusalem above. But Paul doesn't mention that here in this passage because he has a different message. He has a different point that he's trying to drive at here. In other words, this side is Mount Sinai. This side does not. This side has the law. This side is free from the law. That's his point he's trying to make with this story and this allegation. And then he brings out this. He says, but the bird Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, O barren woman, who does not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And at first time, glance, when we read this, one of the things we think of, okay, barren, okay, that would be Sarah, the one who has a husband, that would be Sarah. And then we would think about desolate, the children of the desolate, well, that would be Hagar. And we would be right in, in thinking that, and, and, and we we'll continue to be right in thinking that, but let's... We read that as our opening passage, and I'd like to take a look at that again. If we take a look at this passage in Isaiah chapter 54, it comes right after Isaiah 53, where Isaiah is speaking of the suffering servant. It's probably one of the most remembered passages out of the book of Isaiah, because it talks about how he will bear our iniquities, and he was poured out, and he poured out himself in death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. That's the end of Isaiah 53. And then he breaks into Isaiah, what we would call Isaiah 54. And he says, I want us to listen to this passage. Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not prevailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame, and you will not be humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will not forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like the wife of one's youth, when she is rejected, says your God. Who is he speaking about there? 
Jerusalem. This is what he is speaking about here. And we, we take this and if we understand this then, then we realize that who is he speaking about? He says, but he says, but the Jerusalem above, she above is free. She is our mother. If we skip in immediately to verse 28, he says, and you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. And that is what he's taking in. He's saying, you have a promise. You are not under the law. You are under God's promise. And, and that is what he is wanting us to understand when he brings that verse in in verse 27. He wants us to understand that Jerusalem is barren and that one day that we will see that the numerous of, of the children of Jerusalem, which is ultimately us, and that is what he brings out here. Because her name is not even, because the name of Sarah is not yet even mentioned in this passage. And then it says, But at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now also. And when we look at the, the outline that I put there, it says, Those born according to the flesh will persecute them born according to the spirit the same thing is taking place now as took place when ishmael was mocking and deriding isaac no is isaac was probably around 14 years old when ishmael was about 14 years old when isaac came about and he mocked him he and he goes, I'm the older one. You know, I'm not sure what all he said, but he was seen as the elder son. And Sarah did not like this at all. And when she says, when she said, cast him out, cast out the, the Hagar, get her out of the camp. When we read that story out of Genesis chapter 21, she's upset. She says, get rid of, get rid of her get, and her son. <clears throat> And we read in that story that Abraham was visibly upset. He goes, this is my son. This is my flesh and blood. And he was upset. But the Lord spoke to him and said, listen to her. Listen to your wife. Um, because Isaac is going to be the son of promise, essentially. But through Ishmael, because he is your son, you will have a multitude of nations from him. <clears throat> but when she speaks and she says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, it's very, what well, would be seen as a very close to the language of divorce. Get rid of her. Divorce her and the son. And you don't really get to see the, your son anymore. And they were cast out into the wilderness. And God kept them alive by miracle. And we see that. <clears throat> but this is what is spoken of here. This signifies divorce when she said, cast out the bond woman and her son. Paul uses the same language in the way we need to deal with this heresy of legalism through Judaism. Cast those people out. Because what is he saying? The covenant of works is Hagar, the mother of slaves. He's saying, get rid of that type of thinking out of the church. Get rid of it. Get it out. Cast it out. For the son of the bond woman will not be heir with the son of the free woman. <clears throat> and, and that's the whole point. Because we are children by promise. We have an inheritance that comes by promise. Not by works. It comes by promise and promise alone. <clears throat> but then he says, so then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. And I want to add one extra verse to this as we're looking at it today. It says in chapter 5, verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He leaves us with three imperatives at the end of this passage. And the first one is kind of almost a ruthless one. In other words, 
Don't be a gentleman when it comes to heresy. Cast it out, divorce it, get rid of it. Don't be kind with it. Don't mess around and try to play footsies with this and then try to walk away from it. Cast it out. Divorce that heresy out of your life. Get rid of it. The next one is stand firm. And then the next one was, don't be yoked to slavery again. And how does he say that? And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. That is how he finishes this out. And it is so easy for us, even in our Christian life. Like I mentioned before, legalism doesn't come just in the form of Judaism. It can be done with our own thoughts when we try to interject what we see in a passage of Scripture. When we try to think, well, this is what I think it means. Well, let's go over it and look at it again and understand where allegory is, where it's not, where context is, and letting scripture interpret scripture, understanding that these are things that God wants us to take into consideration. Listen to other people, other godly people. We help each other as iron sharpens iron. This is a way we understand, but it's also a way we can spot those people and those things in our life that can lead us astray. Like I said before, more often than not, it's not people that walk in this door that bring heresy to a church. We find it on the interwebs. We find it on TV. We find it that way. They don't have to walk in here and start doing it, although that is one way it is done. But more often than not, it's done by other things that we bring into our life. <clears throat> so... As we have looked at this passage, as we have looked at this allegory between the covenant of works and the covenant of promise, let's constantly remember that Christ is the promise, that his blood that was shed for us is our only means of salvation. I don't even look at faith as saving me. Now, a lot of people might say, what do you mean? I don't have faith in my faith. I have faith in Christ. That is the key part. It's like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are we saved. We're saved by grace through faith. And it, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of what? Works. Why? Lest any man should boast. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, and we thank you so much that it is all by your grace. Because if it was by works, none of us would ever, ever make it. We thank you so much that it is not by circumcision or anything like that. But ultimately, it is by your work. All the, the, the righteousness that your son did in his life while he walked this earth and living that perfect life. And then by all being obedient and dying on a cross and rising again. Lord, our faith is in that. Your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's uh, close with something.